Good evening. Welcome to this Wednesday night service. If you want to stand, grab a songbook and turn to page number 531. Page 531. All hail the power. singing to start off our Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer meeting. God's good, amen? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin the service. Father, thank you for bringing us together into your house. We pray for safety and protection for those that are still on their way, that we come here safely and ready with a, a ready heart to hear the word of God. Lord, I pray that you'd continue to help us to learn to walk by faith, not by sight, Lord, as we try to add to our series on When Faith Meets Life, God, I pray that you would help us to uh, draw near to you. Lord, this day in which we live, there's so much focus on being socially distant from one another. But Lord, your word says, draw nigh to you and you'll draw nigh to us. So God, may we draw near unto you because there's certainly no, no bad effects, only, only good, only helpful, only positive only uh, Christ honoring uh, uh, can come from that. And Lord, I pray that everything that's done might be for your honor and glory. Every song that's sung and every word we speak might be for you and you alone. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before we sing another song, anybody need a prayer request slip for tonight's prayer sheet? Raise your hand and we'll get you one. Brother Matt's ready. Anybody need one? All right. Right there, and then Brother Bob, right up here, Brother Matt. Ask for one. Anybody else need one? Just fill that out, and after the next song or two, we will uh, have someone come by and pick it up from you. And uh, so we'll just give you a few minutes to fill that out, and we will certainly add it to our prayer list. All right, uh, we're standing. Let's sing another song, Brother Josh. All right. Want to grab your songbook? Page number one. Page number one. My Savior's Love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned. And my 
my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. May be seated. Should have checked with you to make sure you have this this week's bulletin. Anybody need this week's bulletin? We'll get that to you. If you don't, it has our scripture reading in it. And all right, everybody's got it. Going to have Brother Caleb come. We'll do our public scripture reading right now, and then right after that, Brother Terry, we'll have our missionary letters. All right, grab your bulletins. If you don't have a bulletin, take your Bible out. We're still in John chapter eight looking at verses 12 through 18. Ready? Begin. John 8, 12 through 18. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But ye cannot tell whence I come, and whither I go. Ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. John eight twelve through 18. Just a thought, look at verse number 15 there in the middle. He said, ye judge after the flesh, I judge no man. And then the next part it says, and yet if I judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am the Father that sent me. And at this time in, in Christ's ministry, he did not come to be a judge, but we know uh, based on uh, Scripture that one day Christ will judge. Right. And he will judge uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. And there's another judgment uh, which is the great white throne judgment. Just to think about it, both of those, um, just thinking about this earlier, both of those, he says, you will be judged according to your works. And he says his record is true. Think about wh- what do we do in our daily lives when, when we face Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, if we know Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, that judgment is going to be true. Yes. Consider what you do on a day-to-day basis. And if you don't know which judgment you're going to stand at, I would recommend you take a look at the Bible and uh, get that cleared up. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Caleb. All right, Brother Terry, if you'll come, if you have a missionary letter to exchange, if you'll have it out and ready, when he's finished reading this, these letters, we'll exchange the ones that you have. I'm going to read three, and I brought enough for everybody just because we got ba- ba- backlogged. So Amen. just if you want one, you'll, you can have a new one. This one is from Mark and Lydia, and it says, Dear Pastor Wagenschutz, Isaiah 41.10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea. I will help thee, yea. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Luke 12.7, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. It has been strange, but an interesting month. Our country of Ukraine is on a lockdown, and it seems like every day, 
there are new restrictions to what we can and cannot do. Right now, as I write this letter, all the stores except grocery and drug stores are to, are to close. <clears throat> Everyone is to wear a mask. When around people, only two people can walk together on the street. <clears throat> and that rule changes to one on Monday. Our church is doing online services each week, and the translation work is moving along Skype this, is co this coming week. All is different, but the goal is still the same, reaching the lost souls for Christ. At grocery stores, gas stations, drug stores, etc., wherever we can, not everything different is bad, just different. One fa phrase I remember learning when I came to the field 27 years ago was, be, be flexible. Some things never change. No one at church has been infected with the virus, and we, we are hoping and praying that they do not. Our prayers are with you all, and we want to thank all of you uh, of our supporting churches for your faithfulness and love offerings. God is continuously giving us opportunities to be a blessing and witness during this time. Yesterday, a group of street sweepers were walking by the church and asked if we could help them with masks. I was able to buy, buy them all masks, and they all took the tracts and devotional books I gave them. Today, a specialized woman's home called Needing Sanitary Supplies. The government is not able to help them, and there are doctors and nurses with the basic needs. Masks, gloves, protective clothes, soap, and hand sanitizer. With the support coming in, we are still able to help those different places with basic and spiritual needs. Different doors are opening to spread the good news of Christ. Thank you to Bible Baptist of Reedsburg, Wisconsin, Adam Young for the help for the printing ministry, Averyville Baptist, Flatwoods Baptist, North Star Baptist Churches for the love offerings this month. Also to all our supporting churches and friends for your faithfulness and support and prayer, striving to, together to reach Ukraine for Christ. Ambassadors for Christ in Ukraine, Mark, Esther, Lydia, and Hannah. Prem, P.S., 396 times in the Word of God we see the phrase, and it came to pass. Cheer up, this too will pass. Praise the Lord. Shame on the devil. Have a great day. Amen. And then our last letter is from the Rogers, missionaries to Brazil. Dear Pastor Wagon Shoots, a few, uh, the past few weeks have brought some new challenges and decisions to be made for ministers of the gospel across the world. The same is the case here in Brazil. One of the first cases of coronavirus was discovered in our state, which happened to be in our town. There was declared a worldwide quarantine the very next day. Then without much warning, we had to adjust by transferring all of our services online, canceling all activities. While the confirmed cases and death mortality rate is rising, I'm grateful that I can now take opportunity to relay some of the great unseen blessings and opportunities that the Lord has given us, even though we had to cancel a lot of big events that we had planned. <clears throat> One of our supporting churches, Beth Haven Independent Baptist Church in Oklahoma invited our two teenagers to join them join, to join them every other week for an online virtual teen activity. We are so grateful that there are those that are thinking of us and care for our family so much as to include us in their activities. This invitation turned out to be a great motivational starter for our 17-year-old son. Clayton decided to take the same type of online teen youth group service and implement it here in our ministry. What started out to be an idea to minister to our local youth turned into a weekly youth meeting with our young people from over seven churches all over Brazil Amen. participating. He comes up with the icebreaker activity, then he either preaches or chooses another young man to preach that specific meeting, and then they have their Bible quiz time out of First Peter. It has become not only the highlight of the week for our kids, but has also been a help to others during this time. We've been able to keep weekly contact with our people by phone and personal messages. This seems to be an encouragement to most of them. Our online services have also been received very well, with most of the membership watching in their own homes. This past Sunday, we were able to record an evangelistic service, and then, move, then, and then most of the church was able to send it to unsaved loved ones and friends with the idea of being able to plant the gospel of salvation. Amen. Right away, I received some positive feedback from those that I have personally sent the video to and have been trying to reach for some time now. A few even asked me if I would do the same for the following week. The church members also have had a great response, 
and we're looking forward to see how God will work. Prayer request that the members and new Christians will keep their desire to keep growing and serving the Lord during this time. That those who have been visiting the church for the past few months will return once the church is able to meet again. For safety and health concerns, reaching souls for the king, Sammy, Anessa, Clayton, Violet, and Samantha. Amen. So if you want a missionary letter, letter, just hold it up and you can pray for it this week. Amen. So do I understand, Brother Terry, you've got a bunch of other letters with you. So if you have a letter, just we're not going to exchange the one you have. We're just going to give you new letters. And so we'll just take up the old ones. Oh, yeah. If you have a prayer request uh, for tonight's prayer sheet, give it to Brother Terry as he comes around. That way he'll, he's got two hands. He can do double duty, I think. He's a talented fellow, public school teacher and all. He, he can figure it out. Amen. All right. God's good. Amen. Got a chance to visit with Brother Steve and Miss Kathy uh, for a little bit this afternoon. They're not doing too bad physically. And I want to say hopefully, hopefully we're getting the volume better. And I know Miss Sandy's not being able to hear very well either. And then she's been relaying it over the phone to to um, uh, Sister Lois, and she hadn't been able to do that. So hopefully you're able to hear. Hi, Miss Sandy. Hi, Miss Lois. And hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll be able to, to catch it tonight. Um, all right, take your Bibles then, if you will, and open to the book of First Timothy, chapter number six. We have been uh, doing a series that I started when I began doing Bible studies from the office, you know, from the preacher's office, and, and uh, that was a, a lonely setting down there, just me, myself, and I talking to the camera. And so I just began a series on When Faith Meets Life, and I had started kind of uh, doing a few of those some time ago and then just really didn't go very far with it, but the seed thoughts were planted. I had written down quite a few categories that I had thought about doing and just didn't feel led to continue that at the time. And so when faced with the challenges of, of uh, stay-at-home orders and self-quarantine and things like that, it just seemed like uh, that's what the Lord brought back to mind. So we started talking about the walk of faith, and when faith meets the, the issues of life that we come across, and so we've covered such topics as when faith meets impossibility, when faith meets the family, and take our, our um, instruction on the home from the Word of God, when faith meets loneliness, when faith meets difficulties, a few weeks ago, when faith meets crisis, we talked about living from crisis to crisis in the Christian life. It's not the way God wants us to live. And uh, he wants us to go from faith to faith, not from, not from crisis to crisis. Then when faith meets temptation, and then last Wednesday night, when faith meets disappointment. Tonight, I want to add to that, and this may be the last one, I don't know. We'll show up next week and we'll find out if something else, uh, uh, the Lord lays something else on my heart this week. But I want to discuss tonight, uh, well, let's read the, the uh, verse I want to start with and then and I'll give you the title and an introduction. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and in verse number 20, O Timothy, keep uh, that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Father, I pray that you'd help uh, us to have our understanding opened. I pray there'll be something from the Word of God that we glean tonight that will be helpful to us that we will be edified, built up, and strengthened in the Word of God, that we might in these days in which we live, that our faith might increase. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to speak tonight on the subject of when faith meets science. When faith meets science. Now, this is not going to be initially some months back, when I began laying out this Bible study and just never did get around to it, 
uh, it was really going to be one of those, you know, compare science with the Bible type of Bible studies. But that's not what I'm going to do tonight. I decided uh, a few weeks ago when I added this to my list of ones I was going to do currently, that it wasn't going to be that just, you know, God said the earth was round before man figured it out. And, and uh, you know, man is, uh, you know, science is a Johnny come lately to figure out the life of the flesh is in the blood because it was revealed in the Bible long ago. It was going to be that kind of a, of a sermon or a Bible study, but, but instead I just want to kind of in very general terms talk about what this verse is really uh, meant to uh, help us understand. And as we all often say around here, you can't get the right application until you have what? The right interpretation. And so understanding what the Bible says is a, a puts us a long way ahead in finding out how can this be applied then to my day-to-day -day life. And let me just say that there's nothing evil about science. There, and that would be true science, genuine science, nothing evil about it. And, uh, and so we're going to uh, kind of give you a little bit of background, if you'll allow me to do so here, as we look at the passage of Scripture first, so that uh, when we uh, begin to make a few applications, you'll understand the foundation we're coming from. Now, as you begin to study a passage of Scripture, uh, you know, I always look to, to see what the passage is saying, who he's talking to, who's speaking, what is the context of the, of the passage. As Paul writes to young Timothy, a young preacher of the gospel, uh, this, uh, this first letter that he writes that is recorded for us anyway, uh, encouraging and challenging Timothy to keep or guard that which was committed to his trust. The beginning of verse number 20. And then he says, and we're going to look and kind of compare, just look at a few verses here and there, uh, uh, contrast and compare a few things. Uh, and he says, but avoiding of uh, profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. And before we get to the, you know, typically somebody would go, okay, science falsely so-called, that's, that's science. Sci it's not really science. Well, there are things called science that are not scientific, and that is true. That's not exactly what he's referring to here. He's not talking about the evolutionist in the classroom. That's not the interpretation. It's certainly worthy of an application once you get to the interpretation, though. And so let's look real quick and just kind of compare a few verses. First of all, uh, jump ahead with me to 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse number 16. Because we're in the first letter that Paul writes to Timothy, he says, to avoid profane and vain babblings. If you go to chapter 2 of 2 Timothy and verse number 16, the Bible says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. That, verse number 16, this will be a shock to you. But you might want to write this down. Verse 16 immediately follows verse number 15. I know that's a surprise. But it is worth noting that verse 15 is also a very well-known verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then he says, reminds him in this second letter, but shun or avoid profane and vain babblings, they just increase unto more ungodliness. And so profane, uh, profanity, uh, our word profanity, those things which are corrupt in nature, and vain it means empty, worthless, without merit. You know, a lot of arguments are about things that will not matter. And when you argue about vain things or things that will not matter, they increase unto more ungodliness. You say, well, preacher, how could a simple argument over meaningless things 
tend towards more ungodliness. Well, uh, you ever been arguing about something that really has no, no immediate bearing on anything and somebody get angry? Well, there you go. It increased unto more ungodliness. And so a lot of bitterness, a lot of anger, a lot of malice, broken fellowship, a lot of that uh, happens sometimes because people uh, take, uh, uh, they take uh, a, a exception to something somebody else says, and when it comes right down to it, it will not matter one way or the other. And so uh, he says to avoid profane and vain babblings. Also look back with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 7. And we are just, instead of going verse by verse through these books, which would take weeks, months, we are doing a Bible study, but we're comparing uh, verses here within the context. Notice in verse number 7 of 1 Timothy 4, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And so instead of, instead of things that are fruitless, instead of things that will not matter, what should we be investing our life in or our energy in? Well, the Bible says, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You know, I just believe that, uh, and let me just take a uh, page out of current events, that arguing whether or not, you know, uh, the virus that is uh, plaguing the world right now was started intentionally or accidentally, uh, my question is, to what end is that argument? Our time would be better spent, according to the Word of God, exercising ourselves rather to godliness. In other words, you're going to get far more benefit working on your holiness, the God holiness of your life, than it will be trying to settle something that you will not settle, and even if you would settle it, won't matter, because it is what we're facing. It is, it, it's there. Uh, I believe that it's because God is in control that somehow, some way, it works into the plan of God. I do not have to really know how. All I have to know is that it does. God is, uh, it illustrates to me how easily uh, biblical events will and can transpire. It reminds me that Jesus' coming is near, but uh, outside of that, there's no, there's no real tangible benefit uh, to spending time arguing about, about, other, about uh, the ramifications of it and all of that when really what matters is that we exercise ourselves rather unto godliness. In other words, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What, it, what happens... What, what are we profited if we argue the point, win the debate, and yet we have not spent our time in prayer, have not spent time in, in God's word? Uh, we, we're not better off spiritually for it, and uh, we might feel better about ourselves. We might have bragging rights, but those things just tend towards pride, not holiness. Back up, since we're backing up in 1 Timothy, look back uh, also in... Uh, let's see, I had a, another verse lined out and lost track of it. Oh, well, uh, that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. So in, uh, back in, uh, chapter number one, or excuse me, uh, first Timothy chapter six and verse number 20. Uh, the Bible says, matter of fact, I'm going to look one more time. I think I, oh, in chapter 1 and verse 4, that was the other one. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 4. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. And so uh, you see this continued theme as he writes to Timothy the young preacher, and why, why does he write this to young Timothy? 
I'm going to I'm going to guess. I know it's because God gave it to him by inspiration. But we can surmise that the purpose might be because Timothy, as a young preacher, might be uh, prone to get caught up in meaningless debates that will not further the gospel. Uh, it's, uh, it seems like a long time ago, but uh, in other ways it doesn't seem like that all that long ago uh, that uh, I was beginning in the ministry and man, I can think of lots of times where I spent a lot of effort in debates that did not change the outcome of eternity at all. And, uh, and now I, I hopefully, I try to choose my battles a little more wisely and focus on things that really do matter. And so we get back there then, and let's define and look at a couple, the meanings of a couple, usages really, of a couple of words in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, and then I want to make some applications. Uh, first of all, the word science. The word science, uh, uh, the underlying word is the word gnosis. Uh, it is the basis of a movement uh, back in uh, Bible times of Gnosticism. Uh, the word gnosis means knowledge. And, uh, and from knowledge came this, this uh, movement that said knowledge is salvation. That basically just through gaining knowledge, that's how you are saved. You just keep learning and some, at some point you know so much that you basically now you are saved. And knowledge is salvation. It is very close to uh, current a current uh, mindset that the problem with the world is we need more education. The reason for, uh, you know, to combat, combat teen uh, immorality. What we need is another program in the schools. We need more education. Uh, and so they come up with a, a, uh, an education program. They force it into the public schools. Uh, Christian people begin in mass withdrawing their children from uh, public schools over that and a few other issues. When I, it's it's amazing. It, it seems like it's it, you know I don't know if you've ever watched a frog boil. I've watched his legs cook. That's similar. Don't do that, Mrs. Work. Have you tried it? It's good. Uh, frog legs are, are are good. They do tend to move a little bit as you're cooking them. But they're not trying to get away. They're just, it's just things, you know, heating up and, and stuff. But at any rate, uh, it's like one of those things where, you know, you watch something, it seems like, oh, this happens so slowly. But then you take a before and after picture, and boy, it just seems like it happened quickly. That's the way life is. It seems like day to day life, you know, 24 hour cycles, and sun comes up in the east, goes down in the west, and it seems like it's going slowly. But I, I just think about the way things have changed in my lifetime. You say, well, yeah, but preacher, but you're, you're really old. And <laughs> so you've been alive a long time. But, uh, but I grew up uh, uh, in, even in junior high school, all right? Junior high, so I was not a little tiny kid. Junior high school, now it wasn't in the, you know, the heathen north. It was in the, the great state of, put your hand over your heart, Texas, amen. Uh, but I, I, I still remember, I mean, at the start of the school day in the public school, that everyone uh, stood to, at attention, put your hand over your heart, recited the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Someone uh, read a prayer over the loudspeaker, and so every day began with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag and prayer in the public school system. We've come a long way, baby, in the wrong direction. So it's kind of like, you know, it seems like, boy, these things just happen slowly. But yet when I look at the snapshot of and my youth and today, it just seems like it's, you can't imagine these things happening so quickly. And there are so many things that have happened in my life that I said would never happen in my lifetime that I have stopped saying that will never happen in my lifetime. Because it just might. The, this idea of science, it's, it's the word knowledge. As a matter of fact, every other time 
that the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, gnosis, that's Gnosticism, every other time it's found in your New Testament, it's translated by the word knowledge. And so it is knowledge. So, and so think about this, knowledge falsely so-called. You know, somebody can say something's true and it's not true. Genuine, if you want to go back to the idea of scientific knowledge, genuine science is something that can be observed to be true. Okay, uh, laws of gravity. You know, you, everyone here could prove the law of gravity. You could test and prove the law of gravity with no more scientific uh, uh, instruments than you personally have on you. From a coin in your pocket to a pen in your purse, all you have to do is just take it out, hold it out, let it go, and 100% of the time, it's going to go down. Now, don't anybody pull out a helium balloon. There's no telling what you ladies may have in your purse. So I just have to say. Uh, but at any rate, uh, and so uh, this idea of knowledge, but it's false knowledge. That's important when you think about what Paul just told Timothy when he said, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, oppositions of, fi of science falsely so-called. In other words, uh, and by the way, verse 21, which some professing, what is that? That false knowledge, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So, uh, one more word before I get any farther, and that's the word we would normally kind of just focus on that word science, science falsely so-called. But notice the word oppositions, the word oppositions. Now, it's only found one time in your whole New Testament, the underlying word. It is, uh, 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 if you've ever studied languages, uh, you'll, fi you'll, be, you'll find out that English is a composite language. It's uh, made up of many different languages. A, it is a Latin-based language, as are other languages. But there are many words that are like, they were Greek words, and it's a Greek word, but it's also an English word, because there might not have been a word in English, and they brought it over into the English language. And this is one of those words. The word for uh, oppositions here is the word, it's the Greek word, antithesis. You say, well, William, antithesis, that's an English word. Yes, it is. <laughs> so it's also an, it's an English word, and it's a Greek word, the word antithesis. Now, thesis is a, a, uh, a truth, a, a position that you take and support with facts. That's a thesis. The antithesis or antithesis takes the opposite position. In other words, the antithesis is it's like, uh, you know, um, I believe, uh, you know, that, well, uh, I believe that, you know, uh, let's see, my mama's lasagna is the best. And you would say, no, no, preacher. In other words, you've got an antithesis to my thesis. My thesis is my mom's lasagna is the best. Your antithesis is no. Your mom's lasagna is the best. And of course, when we get to heaven, you'll find out you were wrong. Because I'm sure Jesus prefers my mama's lasagna. I'm pretty sure. But anyway. And so the word oppositions is that word antithesis. It is the opposing uh, thought of science or knowledge that is falsely so-called. False knowledge opposing or the antithesis to what? Don't take my word for it. Look at your Bible. You're looking at me like it's written on my forehead. It's in the word of God. False knowledge that is the antithesis of that which is committed to thy trust, Timothy. In other words, the truth that has been committed to you, there is a false knowledge that is the antithesis. It is the opposite. It stands in opposition to what you have been taught. And so the title for the message, because it fits into the 
series is When Faith Meets Science. The real title for this Bible study is Revelation versus Observation. Revelation versus Observation. I want to say to you that there's a, you know, in, in the Christian life today, uh, there's a supposed conflict between facts or science and religion. Uh, in some uh, circles, it's been taken for granted uh, that reason is ne necessarily in opposition to faith. That you can't be reasonable or logical and also believe or be a person of faith. That, um, that uh, what the world calls nature, which I call creation, what the Bible calls, it doesn't matter what I call it, what the Bible calls creation. Uh, that creation and what you can observe in creation as far as you can understand it and interpret it, are somehow in conflict with revelation. That scientific men and theology are somehow two hostile armies fighting one against the other, and that scientific men, and, uh, and so from the one standpoint, science and scientists must be... Uh, somehow uh, cast aside and overthrown. And from the other vantage point, faith must be uh, denounced and debunked. And so in the popular mind of the day, there's this, there's this fear that if we accept science, we, our faith will be undermined. That's only true if the no science knowledge is not really knowledge. People say, well, I know this and I know that. And the Bible talks about people who know nothing as they ought to know. There are people who claim to know how the world began. They claim to know uh, that uh, all the molecules in the universe were drawn together by some invisible force and by the same invisible force were caused to begin spinning at such a high rate uh, uh, of rotation, uh, that, uh, that centrifugal force then finally overcame the force pulling it together and it splattered out all over the universe and, and seeded life and here we are. There are those who claim to know that, but they don't know that. That's knowledge falsely so-called or science falsely so-called. Real science or that which is really known, never conflicts with revelation. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that, but I'm also going to qualify it. When I say that the Bible, or if people look at what, is crea what we call creation, because the Bible calls it creation, and what the world calls nature, what's wrong with calling it nature? Well, because there's nothing natural about nature. Nothing in nature would have happened naturally. It couldn't have happened except God spoke it into existence. And so to the idea that, it, that it's called nature implies that it happened naturally, and it didn't. It happened supernaturally. There was nothing God spake, and there was something. In six literal 24-hour days, God spake, and that which is became a uh, uh, became a life it became uh material it became a uh, 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 matter in in front of it, it just right there in front of God it just he spake and it became there's nothing natural about that it's supernatural and so what we call what man calls nature is God's normal way of supernaturally acting. Sun rises in the east, sets in the west. You know, um, uh, gravity is just enough to hold us down without crushing us into the earth. There's enough uh, sunshine 
to grow plants. There's uh, uh, not, not so much it burns us up, amen. And so uh, there's enough oxygen uh, that we, our bodies can assimilate the oxygen. It, it goes into our blood, uh, blood cell, uh, the cells of our blood and is distributed throughout our body. And uh, if you have too much oxygen, if you get put on 100% oxygen at an increased atmospheric pressure, you will die of oxygen poisoning. And then we all know the effects of not having enough oxygen. You can have oxygen saturation and you can die. You can have too low of oxygen in your blood and you can die. Isn't it amazing? What a stroke of luck. That there's just enough oxygen of the right, within the right range of, of uh, our bodies being able to use at the current atmospheric pressure uh, that it all balances out and, and we can make use of the oxygen. Hey, that's not nature. That's God's normal way of operating. And I point that out to say this. God sometimes supernaturally interrupts his normal way of doing things. You see, God's normal way of doing things is that a uh, man and a woman, and I'll say it the way it's supposed to be, they get married. And, uh, and have children. And that's God's normal way of doing things. God supernaturally, uh, by the way, that's supernatural because it took a creative work of God to create that. He designed it. He created it. Uh, he didn't have help with it. It did not just naturally occur. He supernaturally created it. <clears throat> but then on the day of the incarnation... God did something supernaturally different than his normal way of doing things. You understand what I'm saying? God is in absolute control. Now, we look at that and say, oh, that's supernatural. It's all supernatural. That's just a unique way that God did something compared to the normal way that he does things. You know what that is? That's truth. That's facts. That's knowledge. But where do we get that knowledge? Through revelation. Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Think about this with me. That which we know, we know for absolutely certain through two things. And these both come from the Bible. Number one, we know it for certain because God revealed it to us. Amen? Much of what we know, we simply know because God said it. And then secondly, we also know some of the things we know because of observation, meaning that uh, the book of Romans says that which uh, can be known of that, you know, we see, we see uh, things that God has made and we learn about God from things that he has created. But man, here's, here's where you say, wait a minute, but you said revelation versus observation. That's because here, and here's where so-called science or so-called knowledge gets in the way. True knowledge does not conflict with revelation. As a matter of fact, revelation is the source of true knowledge. But there is, as we back up and we take a look at it, where then does this false knowledge come from? It comes from the fact that man observes things and then draws a hypothesis about its origin or its content or its structure that deviates from what God has revealed. So you and I look at the order that is in the world and we say that agrees with Revelation, we observe, uh, as one uh, thinker wrote, he said, if you've got a lock, there must be a key. The only reason to have a lock. Amen, Brother Bob? The only reason to have a lock. He's a locksmith. The only reason to have a lock is that if you don't have, a, if, you, if you're not going to create a, a key, why would you create a lock? In other words, it's just to lock something up. And so if you've got a lock, there's a key that fits it. The key that fits creation is God is the creator. That's the key. That's the truth. 
man looks at order and he says, why, this must have taken billions of years to evolve through natural selection. That which didn't work eventually died off, and that which did work survived and, uh, and enhanced itself. And, and so man, through his observation, coupled with a rejection of revelation, comes up with his hypothesis of how these things happen. How did this come to be? So... That knowledge, falsely so-called, or science falsely so-called, becomes a, an opposition, an antithesis to the truth that Paul, that God through Paul had committed to Timothy and told him, keep it, guard it, protect it. There is a difference between scientific hypothesis and religious opinions or truth that is revealed. Uh, we need to understand that the, guess, the problem is, the misunderstanding is not between the things themselves. In other words, what we observe is not in conflict with what God has said. The conflict is between what God has said and the guesses of men who seek to be their own priest, their own interpreter, and a God unto themselves. For science, knowledge is simply the facts as long as they agree with the truth that God has given us. So, when the Bible here tells us, tells Timothy, Paul told Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings, in other words, immoral things, worthless or vain or empty things, and oppositions or the antithesis of science that is falsely so-called. It's knowledge that's not true. It's, it's the, by the way, textbooks are full of knowledge that is not true. It's knowledge. But it's false knowledge, it's, it's false facts, it's made up, it's, it's uh, fabricated things that are not genuine. You know, we, we sent people send their children to school and they say the teacher, you know, listen to your teacher, they're smart, they know things. And then they have a teacher that sometimes will stand up and tell them, you know, the earth is, the, the earth is billions and the universe is billions of years old and, and we are descended from monkeys and et cetera. And, and uh, children come home and they say, well, they're, they're the smart person. They must know. But it contradicts God's revealed word. We need to understand, listen, when faith meets science, we need to understand the difference between truth and, and knowledge that is false or falsehoods. The only way you say, well, what? how do we know one from the other? Check it with revelation. Check it with revelation because truth never goes against. Matter of fact, God is the source of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is, you cannot have truth apart from God. So when man says, you know, uh, life here on this planet came, you know, millions of years ago when aliens flying through space, exploring, came to this barren piece of rock and they, they put genetic material. You say, where do you get this? This is in science books. Put genetic material here, and they, you know, you know, like like kicking a little snowball down a hill, got it started, and it just kind of kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and poof, here we are. And uh, and so, uh, listen, that's 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 fairy tales. I mean, that that's as true as that's as true as the Grinch that stole Christmas. I mean, that's it's you know, it's uh, it's got the same factual basis as the Who's in Whoville. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, do, 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 evolution is is no more valid or it's it's no more interesting than a Dr. Seuss 
book. And, and the truth is revealed in the word of God. And so we come back to this where, where he tells Timothy, keep that which I guard, protect the truth. Genuine science, genuine knowledge, knowledge that is true, is not in opposition. Now, you say, what's the big deal? What's the danger? Let live and let live. They want to believe that? No, 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 no. Notice verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. If you don't think the antithesis to truth affects the gospel, you're wrong. Because if they can say, if they can convince people that the Bible is not right concerning where we came from, if they can convince you that you're the product of natural selection, not a holy God, that you're not made in the image of God, you're the product of, of billions of years of, of uh of you know combinations of this and that, and they can convince you of that, then you will not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, the only reason to be saved is because we're sinners. The only reason we are sinners is because we have violated the command of God. And the only reason there is a command of God is because there is a God who gave the command. <laughs> You understand, if you undercut the truth of God's word by knowledge that is false, falsely so-called, things that are called truth that are not truth, you undermine the gospel and people err from the faith. There is, as Brother Caleb said, there is a God to stand before there is an accountability. There is a judgment day coming. When faith meets science, what are we to do? Trust the only thing that you can trust, and that is God and his word. Man will look at the same facts as you look at and find... I, I've, I've used this illustration. I think there are a few of you that, that, may, few of you that maybe have not heard it. I remember I was sitting in a tire shop, which is where I read. You know, I don't know. I spend too much time. I've spent too much time in my life waiting on tires to get fixed or changed or something. And so waiting in a tire shop, I looked down. And there was a, a magazine. Obviously, it's in a tire shop. It's not going to be, you know, fundamental journal. You know, it's, it's, you know, time or life or something, you know. And, uh, and. I glanced down through the highlighted articles that they, you know, listed on the front cover. And there was a thing in there about uh, the, uh, down in Glen Rose, Texas, just south of Fort Worth, where they have excavated human and dinosaur footprints in the same, you know, like human footprints inside of a dinosaur print. Showing that, listen, the earth not billions of years old. The dinosaurs and man are not separated, separated by millions of years of evolution. They, they were there at the same time. And so I was interested to see what this magazine would, would make of that. And so I picked it up when my tires were being worked on, and I began to read. And, and these scientists were uh, saying, you know, they went down there to, to investigate the claims uh, that uh, these uh, human footprints and dinosaur footprints were all there at the same time. And so they went on that they took, uh, they took samples of this and they bisected it to make sure that it was actual, you know, you could follow the sediment, that it, that it followed the print, that it was actually pushed into that shape, not carved in later, and that to verify that it was, in fact, a, a track. And they said it, in fact, was. I'm like, oh, they're getting it. And then it said, uh, went on to say that it's obvious from the excavation that they did that these two tracks were put there at the same time. I'm like, the lights are going on. They're going to, you know, they're going to come out of this believers. And so 
it draws, it comes to a conclusion. It says, so what we've concluded is there must be a dinosaur yet undiscovered that has feet just like man. It's what I call the ABJ syndrome, anything but Jesus, or ABG, anything but God. Aliens, yes, God, no. Dinosaurs with people, feet, <laughs> yes. The Bible, no. And so, but it's taught as fact. It's taught as science. Listen, all you have to do is when faith meets false knowledge, knowledge that is, uh, okay, I, 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 you say, why do you call it false knowledge? Because people know these things, but they're not true. They've put them in their mind. It is what they think, but they are not true. When that happens, when, listen, when, when, they're, when what you think you observe does not agree with Scripture, you take revelation. Why? Because God is the one that knows. Man is constantly guessing. That's why they call it the theory of evolution. Because they don't know. They're guessing. We suppose this could be from that. When faith meets science, revelation versus observation, our observations are only as valid as they support what God has revealed. Listen, I encourage you that you say, well, preacher, do you have an answer for every little squiggly thing that an archaeologist digs out of the ground? No, and I don't have to. I just look at that and say, hmm, squiggly things used to live here. Wow. Doesn't tell me anything about, I mean, uh, listen, it doesn't impact the truth of God's word. Uh, and so we need to understand that, um, you know, science, so-called knowledge that is false, is going to try to challenge our understanding of the Bible. Well, that can't be. Well, listen, there's no way that our world can be just through natural means, through things that would just naturally occur. We can't be here. And yet, we are. How is it that we are here? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He scraped together the dust of the earth, formed the first man, breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It's all the evidence we need is from the one eyewitness who was there. Father, I pray that you'd help us. We've talked about when faith meets the problems of life, when faith meets loneliness, one of the biggest discouraging things in, the, in human life. We're talking about on the news how devastating it has been for people who have not been around others for three months and they're so depressed that they're committing suicide. God, we, we understand that we approach loneliness with faith. We need to approach our fears with faith and our disappointments with faith. And we also need to uh, approach uh, knowledge with faith, that we trust God and his word. Lord, I pray that everything that is said and done tonight, this Bible study has been reinforcing, strengthening, edifying, and helpful to us. And we've been helped by being here tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God's good. Amen. Amen.